we're going to talk to you and introduce you to a um, new biodiversity audit um, that uh, we're currently working on. And the audit, as you would have gathered from the title, is focusing on the North Norfolk coast. So many of you obviously been involved with obviously Norfolk biological recording for quite a while will probably actually be familiar with the biodiversity audit approach. There's been previous audits in uh, the Brex, um, Broadlands and the Fens. Uh, but for those of you who are less familiar with the audit approach, we'll start the talk today with a bit of information about what a biodiversity audit is and the type of conservation it unlocks. And then after that, we'll move on to some of the reasons why there's a particularly pressing need for an audit for North Norfolk. And then after that, we'll explain a bit more about the technicalities of doing a biodiversity audit and what we'll be doing. And we'll finish up on basically how we hope this audit of the North Norfolk coast will inform some of the future challenges for the area. So it's a, it's a trio act of us um, today, um, but there's four of us um, from UEA um, who are on the biodiversity audit team. So there's Professor Do uh, Paul Dolman, um, so he um, he sends his apologies for this evening, um, but Paul um, very much pioneered uh, the biodiversity audit approach and indeed uh, led the uh, first audit within uh, Breckland. So he um, he's one of the co-leads of the project. The other project co-lead is Dr. James Gilroy, and he's a lecturer at UEA. And we also have Dan Salas with us as well, and he's a research associate at uh, UEA, and he's doing a lot of the physical data collection and um, or data collation, data cleaning and bringing all the information together. And myself, I'm a um, postdoc researcher at UEA, um, working partly on this, but also um, with a cluster of farmers in Breckland. So without a moment to spare, I will pass, pass you over to James Gilroy for the first bit of this talk. Thank you, Rob. Okay. I'm just pressing the buttons. So should give you control now. Fingers crossed. I think you, hopefully you can all hear me as well. Rob yeah. obviously can. So brilliant. Thank you, um, Rob. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so as Rob said, um, I'm one of the co-leads of this project together with Paul Dolman. Uh, so we're both ecologists based at UEA. Uh, and what I'm going to do to start with is just say a few words to sort of set the scene of um, why we're doing this audit project, what it's all about. Uh, as Rob said, many of you may well be familiar with the, the audit process uh, and, and why we do these things. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the specific context of the, the Norfolk coast uh, and why it's um, uh, extremely timely that we're, we're going about this, this project now. Um, so I'm sure you're all extremely familiar with uh, the environments of the Norfolk coastline. Um, and it's a really valid question to ask why we need a biodiversity audit of this part of the UK. It's possibly one of the best studied uh, areas in the United Kingdom for biodiversity in terms of the, the, the depth of knowledge that we have about the wildlife that inhabits the coastline. And that probably means it's one of the best studied places on earth uh, for in terms of biodiversity knowledge just by the fact of um, the, the, the sheer depth of history of natural history recording in the UK uh, going back so far and uh, Norfolk being a sort of historic centerpiece of that natural history recording. So we know a tremendous amount already about the biodiversity of the Norfolk coast. And it's also um, arguably one of the best protected uh, landscapes in the UK. Um, a significant proportion of the coastline is managed uh, specifically for wildlife. It's within reserves, nature conservation sites. Uh, the farm portions, uh, a huge uh, amount of the farmland is within uh, countryside stewardship agreements that are specifically about conserving biodiversity. So it's really one of the, the landscapes that's uh, perhaps best protected um, within the UK. But at the same time, it's uh, a part of um, the world that faces an awful lot of challenges. And we're going to talk a bit about some of the upcoming environmental challenges that are specifically uh, perhaps threatening coastal habitats of Norfolk. And it's partly about those upcoming challenges, why we're, we're so keen to, to, um, to conduct this biodiversity audit now. Um, but really what this project's about is about 
pulling together all of that knowledge. And there's this vast resource of knowledge, data and information about biodiversity on the coast. It's about pulling that together and trying to make sure that we make the, the maximum use of that knowledge and information uh, when it comes to making decisions about how to actually uh, manage and conserve habitats on the coastline. So biodiversity auditing, this is something that's, um, that's been pioneered, as Rob said, by Paul Dolman uh, at UEA. Um, and it's really an approach that's based around the, um, the premise that although we do an awful lot to try and conserve biodiversity, we do an awful lot to manage and protect habitats. A lot of that action, a lot of the action on the ground to conserve and protect biodiversity is targeted towards quite a narrow subset of the species that actually make up our ecosystems. We tend to focus a lot as conservationists on the things that we, we know well and we can count easily. Uh, so larger organisms, especially birds, tend to feature a lot in conservation planning and the sort of data we use to make decisions. The biodiversity audit um, came about because of the realization that it's really essential that we don't just focus on a few species, especially the ones that we know very well like birds, but we make sure that we also gather together as much information as we can about all the other species that make up the ecosystem. And of course, any given uh, environment, the vast majority of species that inhabit that place are not birds or mammals or vertebrates. They're usually the small organisms, invertebrates and plants. Just to give an example of that, the first audit that was carried out by Paul's team was in the Brex, which is a, an area I'm sure many of you know well. Um, and that audit process pulled together all the knowledge and information about the biodiversity of Breckland, created the, um, a long list of all the species recorded in the Brex landscape. And it came to about 12,000 species. If you look at the breakdown of those species groups, about 2,000 of the species in the Brex are fungi, lichens, and mosses. Another nearly 2,000 uh, uh, plants, vascular plants and, and bryophytes. And then you've got about 6,000 species that are the insects, uh, crustaceans, arachnids, the invertebrate groups. You're left with just this tiny little sliver, uh, the species that are um, the, the vertebrates, those groups that we know best, that we tend to, uh, to, to study most as scientists. And we tend to kind of focus a lot of thinking around the um, birds, mammals, fish, and reptiles. And amphibians. They, re they really represent this sort of sliver of biodiversity on the top of this enormous system, the vast majority of which are um, these small organisms. And there is this sort of uh, tendency in conservation management to focus our thinking on those vertebrate groups that we know well, that are fairly easy to study. What the audit aims to do really is to make sure that all these other species, and we often term these the, the off radar biodiversity, especially in terms of conservation management, make sure that these aren't left behind and make sure that whatever we do to try and protect species through conservation actions also delivers for, for everything else. So it focuses a lot on making sure that we understand what all of these other species need beyond the things that we, we know well and we study um, quite intensely. And so we talk about all of these groups, the invertebrates of plants as being the off radar biodiversity. That's very much off the radar in terms of conservation management, habitat management, conservation planning, things like um, indicators of biodiversity change. But it's absolutely not off the radar of people who go out and actually record biodiversity. And here I'm really talking about the audience that we're speaking to tonight, the natural historians, wildlife enthusiasts, people with expertise who go out and specifically um, record those groups, uh, invertebrate groups, plant groups. And we actually have an enormous wealth of data um, on these, uh, these less, um, less well studied in terms of the sort of scientific conservation research, but very well studied in terms of um, people going out and recording them, taxonomic groups, so the plants, the invertebrate groups. But all of that knowledge falls within this kind of, um, this resource base that's in uh, uh, resources like 
Um, NBIS, the Norfolk Biodiversity Information Service, where people submit their records of species, the data that's submitted to the county recorders, uh, data that's submitted to um, uh, publications like the transactions of the Norfolk Norwich Naturalist Society, and all the knowledge that's in, in the brains of the people who go out and record these things and know about them, know where to find them, know how to identify them. There's this enormous resource, but there's a bit of a disconnect between the availability of all of that data and knowledge on these groups and the people who are actually making, uh, who are responsible for protecting the habitats on the ground, the, the, the land managers, the decision makers on many levels are people who are making big decisions about what to do with, with habitats and landscapes. And especially the farmers. So farmers are uh, do an awful lot um, of conservation action in Norfolk. An awful lot of the land uh, that's being managed for, for conservation is managed by farmers. What the audit is about is about pulling together all of this data and this knowledge that's held by people like yourselves who, who go out and record biodiversity, know a lot about biodiversity, especially these more obscure groups, pulling all, trying to pull all that knowledge together, putting it into a, um, as much as possible into a document that synthesizes that knowledge into some guidance that can then be used by the people who actually manage the habitats to make sure they're managing habitats to deliver for all the biodiversity, including all of the obscure groups that, that are perhaps not typically the focus of conservation action. So that's the principle behind it. It's about pulling together knowledge and putting it into a format that's easy for land managers, farmers, decision makers to use when they're actually going out and doing things to try and benefit biodiversity. And I mentioned farmers on that slide, farmers being a key kind of group of uh, people who actively do conservation. This particular project is, is really um, driven by um, a group of farmers, or primarily farmers, um, the North Norfolk Coastal Group, who got together and they're the ones who are actually funding this project. And that's why, for the moment, although this is technically the, the, the Norfolk Coast Biodiversity Audit, the first stage is just focusing on the section of coast that, that goes from uh, Kelling, uh, Kelling Hard in the eastern extent, round to the, the, the Grey Two's mouth in the wash. So it's the northwestern chunk of the Norfolk coastline. This is about 145 kilometres is where um, this group of, of land managers, uh, the North Norfolk Coastal Group, have come together and they recognised um, the need for a biodiversity audit to help them optimise the sort of management they're doing uh, for, for conservation. So this is a group of 37 different stakeholders along the coastline. They cover the majority of that coastal strip of habitat. 33 of them are private individuals, farmers, and then there are um, five environmental bodies who also manage land along the landscape. And they were all pulled together by, by the guy in the, the photograph you can see there, David Lyles, who's a farmer uh, up at Muckleton Farms at, at, at Burnham Deepdale, the chair of the group. And he's really quite a remarkable guy. Uh, he's a, he's a, an extremely passionate conservationist farmer, but he's also managed to bring together this huge group of people and put them all on the same page. And they're all actually coming together um, with a view to coordinating everything they do for conservation to try and maximise the delivery for biodiversity. And they uh, sort of organically recognised how valuable it would be to have this biodiversity audit, this guidance that can make sure they can deliver for all the biodiversity. So this is where the projects come about and it really is led by that, that farm-led group um, trying to make the best of, of the land that they've got for, for, for managing for biodiversity. And so the approach that it takes is really to, to pull together as much information and data that, that is out there uh, existing in databases and the knowledge that exists in all of the, the experts uh, and different species groups that are out there, pull it together to come up with some guidance, some simplified guidance to make sure that we can provide management that delivers for all species. And we try and simplify it by putting species into groups where we can say this group of species really needs this habitat feature or this kind of management. And once everything is grouped up like that, we can come up with a sort of a recipe of things the landscape needs to have in it in order to deliver for everything. And the way the process uh, unfolds is we pull together data, 
and there's vast amounts of data out there. So that some of the numbers here for, for the Breckland audit and the Broads audit that's already been done, they, they're going on for or over a million records uh, of species in these areas that we can pull together and analyze to try and look at where species are. And then a really central part is bringing in the advice and expertise of people like yourselves, people who go out and record natural history uh, and know about these species groups, especially these more obscure species groups. So a key stage in the process is to have workshops where we invite um, enthusiasts, experts, people who know about species groups to come and look at the data with us, look at the information with us and make sure we're, we've, we're getting our information right and bring that expertise and knowledge into the process. And that's something that, you know, one of the reasons we're speaking to you this evening is to, to flag that as this project develops and as we go through this process, we're going to be actively seeking to bring as much of that knowledge and expertise as we can in through workshops. And we'll talk a little bit more about how those will work um, a bit down the line. But before that, I think what we wanted to do next was go through some of the, the results from some of the previous uh, audits that have been done, especially focusing on the Brex one, to really tr try and kind of highlight the value that this process can bring and how it can potentially deliver really positive change for conservation. And so now I'm going to hand back to Rob and he's going to talk through some of the, um, the work that he's done on the Brex biodiversity audit, where Rob's been quite pivotal in the last few years in developing the, the conservation that's happened off the back of that. So I'm going to hand uh, control back over to Rob now. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, James, for that. And as as James has already mentioned, I'm I'm, I'm going to cover a bit more about the uh, the Brex audit, mainly thinking about what this has achieved in terms of the conservation that doing a biodiversity audit unlocks. And the reason I've again focused on the Breckland audit to begin with, primarily down to the fact it was the first one that occurred, and there's been quite a good amount of time about a decade now of time has elapsed between the audit happening and conservation work starting to filter through and again as i'm sure all of you are are aware the brex is, is a region i'm sure most of you are already familiar with it's obviously um it contains the towns of fetford and brandon and it's um a region that's characterized by its sandy soils and extreme climate so it's uh, famous for having a or it can achieve to achieve a frost in every month of the year um, so it becomes one of the coolest places um, during different periods of the year but it's also one of our warmest uh, places as well in the country so it has this very extreme climate and quite unique uh, soil type um, is, uh, is found there, particularly with this variation of chalk and acid sands, which gives rise to the tremendous biodiversity that you get there. So as we've mentioned with the audit process so far, one of the key bits of this is once we've pulled together information on what is within a landscape and which of those species are conservation priorities. So with the Breckland audit, it flagged up there are over 12,000 species within the region. But probably more impressive still is just over 2,000 of these have some kind of priority status. So they're nationally scarce, rare, red data book, uh, red data book sorry, or IUCN threatened. And once you've identified your conservation priorities, it's this whole concept of grouping species together into these groups. So almost imagine a scenario, I guess, if, if you had 2,000 species plus, having an action plan for each one of those would be a, a, a complete nightmare. It would be way too many species. So the idea is to group them into these guilds, these management guilds that cut across tax. And in the Brex, you've obviously got some important guilds with large number of species for wet parts of the landscape, like pingos, and the audit looked at particular ways of how these particular wet features can be managed to maximize their biological interests. But of course, the Brex is particularly famed for its dry open habitat assemblage, the type of species you get on the heaves, on the arable, or the open areas of Fetford Forest. And the key things the audit was demonstrating here is the role of physical ground disturbance in catering for this important dry open habitat biological resource. So there's still a considerable number of species that are associated with lightly lightly grazed, very lightly disturbed or undisturbed conditions. 
but these these types of conditions were being maintained certainly over the last 20 30 years by essentially the premise of grazing heaves or grazing part of the grass and landscape and that would have catered for these species but what the audit demonstrated in a, a very significant way is a vast number of the biological resource here is associated with physical disturbance in these systems and it, it really challenge the status quo that in areas where you've you've got like grazing to to find dynamic ways to bring that disturbance back and it's it's not just the disturbance in its own right it's the heterogeneity and the variety that that provides having patches of undisturbed and disturbed areas in close proximity particularly for species um, such as hymenoptera that will move about and feed in some areas and perhaps nest in in other locations so th this is some of the stuff that the uh, Brex audit was really highlighted as important. And it's very hard when you hear these numbers of 2000 priority species for the, the actual identity of these species to be lost. But these are the key parts and it's, it's the knowledge that naturalists have built up over many, many decades that then filters through to these powerful statistics about how many species a gill can cater for. So within the Brex, you've got no, no shortage of charismatic invertebrate and plant species to pick from. Uh, so the one on the left, that to me looks like an alien when you look, zoom in with a microscope, is um, probably more well known as the Breckland, Lega, Breckland leverbug. Aracronolis uh, wartelli, and it's a, it's a species that um, when they did the audit back around 2010, um, it was believed to be regionally extinct. It hadn't been seen in nearly a couple of decades, um, but around 2011, 2010, around the time the audit was finishing, actually, it was discovered again at a site called Ramparts Field, and it's since cropped up in a few other areas within the uh, within the Brexit. So when I say regionally extinct, it hadn't it hadn't been picked up in the UK for that period of time. And it's a species that's associated, it feeds off common stalks bill. So you, you find it in bare, sandy, warm areas, um, usually rabbit warrens, which provide the open conditions for its food palm. The weevil on the right is called, uh, I always get this one muddled up. It's called the sluggish weevil, Colonoris uh, pigra, I believe its name is, and it feeds off thistle. Uh, so the sort of conditions you have where you create disturbance, perhaps in a cultivated margin where thistle comes up and it will feed off that. It's not spectacularly rare as um, the Breckland lever, lever bug on the left, but it's uh, still a, um, a nationally scarce species. Above that, you've got this really pretty speedwell plant called Veronica verna, spring speedwell. You can see these brilliant, tiny, tiny uh, flowers on the plant. And again, this is a species that um, that you get in the Brex and is the Brex is particularly well known for. And you, you'll find this around, again, rabbit warrens and these kinds of areas. The one on the far right with this brilliant iridescent green elytra and shine. I, I nearly fell off my chair when I found this beetle. I was so happy to find it. I've only found it once. It's called a Phonus laticollis, um, also known as the downy set aside beetle. It's got these brilliant yeah, the, the, the colours just blow you away when you look at it through a microscope and it's um, another species that does particularly well in the Brex. You also get it in Wessex and some of the chalk grass and areas and cultivated margins there. But it's a, it's a ground beetle species that thrives of cultivated margins and it feeds off uh, the ruderal plants that you get in these, uh, in these margins. But it also requires a juxtaposition of cultivated margin and even quite a small area of undisturbed buffer grass strip. So for example, the grass that isn't cultivated next to a hedgerow and that's that's where it will overwinter. And the, uh, the, the plant that you can see very closely zoomed in at the bottom is um, called Breckland mugwort. And um, again, it's a, uh, another species that the Brex is particularly famed for. Um, it's also famed by the fact there's a ground beetle species that almost exclusively feeds off Breckland mugwort. So Breckland mugwort is incredibly range restricted, uh, pretty much in the Brex. I think there's a couple of other locations. One I believe is in Wales, but there's a beetle called Amara fusca, also known as the wormwood moonshiner, a really nice name that feeds off the seeds of the beetle, of, of the plant. You often see it around October time and late September, crawling up the plant and feeding it. So this amazing story of a very range restricted plant, 
with a range restricted ground beetle clinging on it. But this is just to give an idea that you've got these species with perhaps here subtly different requirements, different requirements for disturbance in different ways, but the audit approach brings this knowledge together and the knowledge importantly that natural historians are brought to, together to, uh, to, to develop these management guilds. So when the audit finished, there are a few immediate conservation actions that happen quite quickly. So one of these were the uh, the likes of organisations such as butterfly conservation and plant life. So butterfly conservation have done a lot of work on helping to create and restore disturbed open areas for species like uh, the grizzled skipper and dingy skipper and a suite of uh, other lepidoptera species, particularly rare scarce moths that you get in the brex. And likewise with plant life, some of the plants you've seen in the previous slides, but others um, such as a uh, prostate perennial null, a, a, a real a real specialist and endemic to uh, to the UK and a real a real specialist for Brecklanders, have, have, have been targeted by by the likes of Plant Life and other organisations uh, by taking the recommendations of the audit and delivering it. This is an example I love to show. It's one of uh, Brandon Heath um, zoomed in and this work was funded by um, the Heritage Lottery Fund and the idea was to go in with a 360 digger, create these little pits basically with a south facing bank to create this disturbed area but also a south facing area for um, species that require that perhaps again like some of the hymenoptera species to, to get, capture the warm part of the day and uh, and also deal with the issue of trying to get rid of the material that you create by doing this disturbance by creating a bank and if you can see this map here it's um I was about to say it's almost like the moon it's not quite, but uh, it's uh, you, you've got this crater image across the area. Another really important output of the Brex audit was the creation of a, well, will be a creation of a vast network of Ryden forest wides. So the Forestry Commission have got a program for creating open habitat, and I believe it's around 750 odd hectares, maybe slightly more, it could be slightly less. But the idea is where you have a ride in the forest that I'm sure many of you have walked down is to leave basically a 30 meter strip turf strip it to create that bare open habitat and essentially create almost these super invertebrate and plant highways that permeate through the uh, the forest landscape linking together arable heath and uh, other bits of the forest so really exciting landscape stuff happening one that i'm particularly um well i guess i have to be particularly engaged in because it was my phd is another bit of work that the Breckland audit influenced and it is all to do with this program of management on the Stamford training area. So those of you who are not familiar with the area, I, I argue it's one of the most, or if not the most beautiful landscape in uh, in Norfolk. I certainly think the, the views on a summer's evening such as this one, when you look for Niger, take your breath away. It's the UK's largest grass heath site. There's about 360 odd hectares of contiguous grass heath in this landscape that spans your acid conditions and it's an area that's owned by the Ministry of Defence and they've owned it since the, um, the late 1930s the turn of World War II. Prior to that it was a combination of rabbit warrens and, um, and uh, farmed habitat and if the military hadn't taken this over this would be Fetford Forest today or farmland or perhaps an extension to Wattam. So this huge amazing landscape incredibly important triple si but it's a landscape that's undergone change in the past 70 80 years and in recent decades as well and by change i mean the type of ecological processes that are operating two really obvious ones are the decline of rabbit populations so previously these bare open habitats that the biodiversity audit demonstrated that was so important have since been lost and presumably the species that are associated associated with these areas have been at least partly lost as, as, as well and uh, essentially you lose your rabbits the grass builds up and you have a, essentially a more homogenous closed grey sward another important process is um, nutrient deposition a factor that's affecting many of the heaves and in fact some areas more severely than stanter as well and this is a, a problem that conservationists face across the board in terms of how you try and arrest these problems of nutrient deposition in these systems but on the back of the audit what we wanted to do is to see whether we can restore the recommend well basically restore these conditions by taking the recommendations of the audit which was essentially saying open up these swords create physical disturbance and do it in a complex way and we wanted to find out crucially whether this desk based approach of doing an audit actually works in real life so it's almost 
guess for a better phrase, put in, put in your money where your mouth is for a, a better phrase. But the idea was to do it in an experimental way so we could track the progress of doing this. And to do this, we, we used farm machinery. We used either um, sort of an agricultural plow or a rotary, rotivator. And the image on the right shows you what the plot looks like once it's fully developed, but they, they didn't always look like this. And the way it essentially worked back in 2015, when this experiment started, we went in and cultivated a single two hectare block. The following year in 2016, another hectare, two hectare block was created with the middle hectare hit again. And in the third year, 2017, we went in and cultivated another block. So essentially you have this bit in the middle that's been cultivated three times annually, a two-year-old fallow, a one-year-old fallow, and a fresh bit. And these are managed in this rotation to create disturbance and complexity within the landscape. And there were 40 of these dotted around Stanta and avoid in a central part of the state, uh, the, the site, which is known as the impact area, which is notorious for unexploded ordnance. So if you if you went in there for track, you could end up um, yeah, 30 feet in the air. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be advisable. So we we spread these around the landscape, and thanks to a lot of help from an, a, a huge number. Well, I, I I did a relatively obscure small part of this. I'm particularly fond of the ground beetles, as you may have picked up from one of the previous slides. Um, but we had a range of other recorders helping us with this uh, with this project to essentially arrive at around 30,000 invertebrates from nearly 900 species. So help from Doreen Wells, who covered the ants, Nick Owens, who looked at um, the bees and wasps. We had Colin Lucas, who looked at the leafhoppers. Uh, Steve Lane, who covered um, all the all the beetles I couldn't do, which is most of them. Um, so I, I took the ground beetles on, but he did all the rest, including a notorious group uh, known as the uh, the rove beetles and staphylinids, um, and a, a chap called James McGill as well looked at the spiders. But we also had really um, support ongoing from other people as well. So um, Martin Collier helped um, us pull together and check over some of the uh, the beetle data when we pulled it through at the end. Um, Peter Lamley helped our um, plant surveyor uh, when she did her MSc on um, from the quadrats you can see on the left, and likewise uh, Tim Pankhurst as well. And uh, th this help that the recording community provided us for this project was invaluable. We wouldn't have been able to do it without them. And if we didn't have this, we would have only been able to look at a small subset of taxa, which would have gone against the grain of what we were trying to uncover and pick out. So I'm not going to cover this much more today. Um, I'm, I hopefully I'll cover this in another talk in the future. But basically, the take home message was that the recommendations of the audit work. So when you look at the the priority species that the audit was showing you, you effectively, by creating this complex management compared to the status quo, which is grass and graze by a sheep lightly, you double the number of priority species. And more recently, this has led to another important landscape scale conservation initiative called the Breckland Farmers Wildlife Network. And this is a, a truly quite amazing project. And what's quite amazing about this is where we've had successes with the audit influence in the way management occurs in the forest or the heaves. This is bringing us in with the farming, farming landscape like James has touched upon earlier. And there's 32, 33 farmers that have joined up to this initiative. And the idea is to join up conservation between all these farms by doing the type of the management the audit recommended. And a very obvious one that we're initiating with BFWN is this idea of cultivated margins. These areas at the side of field by cultivating and leaving, you can create this network through the Brex, targeting the best areas and quite literally creating joined up landscape scale conservation. And it's, it's essentially down to all your records and expertise that this is possible. The audit facilitates it and brings it up, but it's, it's the records that um, enable all of this. And yeah, through this project at the moment, we're just trying to find ways of where these species are likely to be in the landscape by using the biological records to create these heat maps for every farm to uh, show where um, yeah, where doing the management would be particularly profitable. And again, I, I this is something probably for another talk in another day, but just to illustrate what the audit approach can be used for. And now to hand back to James for um, to, to introduce this audit on the North Norfolk coast and how this is going forward. Thanks, Rob. Sorry. Um, yeah, so zooming back up to the, the Norfolk coast um, and 
as Rob's just sort of outlined, the um, the Breckland example gives a really good kind of flavour of what happens after the audit's done. Uh, in, in the Brex, it, it threw up a lot of interesting things uh, about bits of the landscape that weren't being prioritised by the conservation management plans on the heaths and the farms. Uh, and then implementing those can help benefit a whole load of, of these priority species. So the, the aim is to do the same kind of thing uh, for the Norfolk coast. Um, but again, as I said at the start, there's a huge amount we already know about the Norfolk coast and its biodiversity. Um, so we've got to be very careful not to sort of reinvent the wheel here. We've got to take stock of what's already known and then look at what the, the key unknowns are and, and, and focus in on those when it comes to trying to pull in knowledge and fill in knowledge gaps to make sure we can can make the most of um, conservation effort in the region. And that's the stage we're at now, thinking about where uh, what the focuses are going to be um, and possibly uh, sort of improving and enhancing the management of habitats along the coastline. A good starting point when it comes to thinking about what we already know about the coast is Natural England State of the North Norfolk Coast Report that was published a couple of years ago, which is a really comprehensive assessment Natural England did uh, of all of the, the habitats and key species groups along the coastline. And one of the things they did was to evaluate the condition of habitats and of species groups. Um, and this really highlighted one of the things that I, I, I sort of um, mentioned towards the start, which was how uh, well preserved a lot of the habitats are in the coastline. Um, so in fact, the, the habitat condition index in this pie chart on the left, um, more than half of the habitats within uh, the Norfolk coast are, are assessed to be in good condition. There's a reasonable chunk that are assessed to be in poor condition, but actually in, in national terms, this is really good going. Um, having more than half of the environment in good good condition for biodiversity is, is far better than the, the national average in terms of the state we are at the moment. The report also looked at risks um, and it, it did highlight that most of the habitats are at, at risk in the future. And there's a whole suite of risks that I'm going to sort of touch on, uh, we're going to touch on uh, in a bit, thinking about looking forward. Um, another thing that the, this report did was it looked at species groups. And again, like many of these things, the, the primary focus was on birds because these are the things that we had the best quality data for we know the most about and they found again that the condition of both the breeding and the winter uh, bird populations were the majority were in good condition um, they face risks but most of the speed the bird species are faring relatively well um, but a key thing this report did it looked at all of the other species assemblages uh, the non-birds essentially and it immediately flagged that that issue that, that we talked about at the very start that once you look beyond birds at other taxonomic groups, our knowledge rapidly falls off. And this here we're talking about the knowledge that sort of feeds up to the higher level decision making. The vast majority of other species, or, or more than half at least of other species, are classed as having unknown status. And most of those are assessed in this report as being at, at risk. So the majority of non-birds are thought to be at risk but an awful lot of them, their condition and status is unknown. So this just highlighted again the need for, for more information, and more data to be brought together on everything that isn't birds um, in the environment. The, in terms of the actual landscapes of the Norfolk coast, in particular that North Norfolk coast strip that's the focus of this stage of the project, um, there's a range of environments that are the current kind of focus of conservation and an awful lot of conservation action at the moment focuses on the, the fresh grazing marsh habitats um, that are extremely important for a whole suite of, of uh, priority species, particularly again birds. There's an awful lot of effort goes into managing these grazing marshes, and these fresh marshes, to make sure that they support um, a lot of rare breeding birds, uh, wading bird communities. And it's likely that they support a whole suite of other um, more obscure uh, taxonomic groups and uh, invertebrate species. But we don't necessarily know uh, with that level of detail that the audit allowed us to go to the BREX, exactly what features of these sorts of habitats are really needed to make sure that they can deliver for that full suite of biodiversity. And there's this other key set of habitats along the coastline uh, in the more literal zones, the dune complexes, the salt marshes, 
that are also massively important for, for a whole range of priority species. And in those environments, again, there are potentially all sorts of uh, fine scale habitat features that are necessary to make sure you can deliver for all of the species that, that live in those environments and making sure that we manage these habitats to deliver those sort of fine scale features is, is a really important priority uh, for moving forward with this audit. And a, a really key and quite complicated aspect of the coastal audit, more so than, than for example, the Brex, is that this is an incredibly dynamic environment. It's ever changing. And there's an awful lot of change upcoming. And I'm going to talk in a minute about the threats posed by sea level rise, which we, we know is going to be a, an increasing feature of the landscape. But it's also really important to recognize that the Norfolk coastline has been changing forever. It's constantly changing and it always has been changing. And in fact, most of these habitats, and these environments are dynamic by nature. They shift around in space and the species communities that, that live in these environments will be adapted to that kind of dynamic change. And so the, the temptation as, as humans is always we want to try and maintain things in a state that we think is the best state, the status quo. And we have a tendency to try and sort of hold things in a stasis that we're happy with. In an environment like this, it's actually more natural to allow the dynamic processes to, to take place and the changes to happen and sort of roll with those. So it's really important when we're thinking about management to think about how we can allow the system to, to have those dynamic changes um, and to stay biodiverse and to stay resilient and stable. To, to sort of put that into context a bit more, it's really helpful to look at the, um, the images that we have, how the coastline has transformed. And I'm sure most of you are, will be aware of how rapidly the coastline is changing in terms of uh, areas of erosion, areas of accretion, all linked to sea level rise. Big chunks of the coastline are, uh, are eroding rapidly. We're losing big chunks. We're also gaining in some areas. And this image um, is one example. Here we're looking down on Titchwell RSPB Reserve. That's the greeny chunk in the middle. So over in the, the top left there, you can see Thornham Point. And on the right, you can see a big area of salt marsh. Um, which I've, I've put a hoop around here. And this, this image was from 2019. This is actually an area where the coastline is, is expanding outwards. So material is being deposited and the salt marsh is accreting and increasing in, in cover. So if you, if you zoom back um, to 1999, you can see quite a stark difference in that area. I'm just gonna flip back again to 2019. You can see in that hooped area, how much uh, the salt marsh has spread um, and increased outwards through the deposition of, of material. What's really interesting about this example is this is um, the land spreading outwards towards the sea. If you zoom back even further, and we can look back as far as the 1940s with aerial imagery, the first set of aerial images produced um, by the RAF, you can see that back then the land actually extended much further out towards the sea. And in fact, the process that's happening now is something of a reclamation of land that was, was previously um, uh, uh, actually farmland. You can see the position of the seawall here well outside where our yellow hoop is. And all of this area was actually would have been grazed um, grass pasture at that time. And we can go back even further if we look at the first um, OS map, uh, the first edition of the OS map, you can see at that point, the, the land did extend much further out and it was mapped as farmland at that time. So what we now look at, look at in terms of the salt marsh habitats of, um, of Titchwell and all of the, that marsh complex, if we go back uh, 100, 150 years, it would have been a very different kind of environment. And a, a key, another key part of this audit process is to take a look back and think about what the history is of the landscape and what that means for the species that occur there. And it's often our conservation management is predicated on this idea of trying to recreate some sort of historic baseline, some, called it, some sort of traditional management. But often we don't have a very good idea of what that really is. Um, and it's really interesting to talk to landscape historians and to look back at old imagery. And it can give you some interesting insights. And for me, it's, it's quite 
um, my perception of what the history of the landscape was changed a lot when I went through that process. And I'm going to show just a couple of historic images um, that are held in the um, the Norfolk County Council's got an amazing website called Picture Norfolk. I don't know if you've seen it, where you can look back through archives of old images, uh, old photographs. And these are a set of images that come from Cly and Salt House from around about 1910. And they show um, what that landscape looked like at that time. And actually, it's it's remarkable how different it is from my sort of perception of what the historic traditional management of those salt marshes would have been like. So at that time, there was an awful lot of grazing by sheep. The grazing, the, the sheep were put out onto the salt marsh, they were grazed, they're not grazed anymore. Um, the salt marshes sort of blended seamlessly with heathland. And it's remarkable how little um, vegetation structure there was in these old landscapes. It always amazes me how few trees there are when you look at old maps and old images of what the North landscape looks like 100, 150 years ago. Um, there was actually far less tree cover then than there is now. And the landscapes were actually used quite intensively. But they would have been very rich in biodiversity. Um, and these sorts of heavily disturbed, grazed, but very low nutrient environments, very much like the environments that um, that are identified as important in the Brex for an awful lot of these Breckland specialists that needed these um, quite disturbed habitats. So it may well be that the same kind of habitats that we found to be really important, especially for invertebrates in the Brex, may turn out to be an important feature of these Norfolk coastal habitats because they would have been there in the way these, these, these habitats were managed over the last couple of hundred years. But while we're doing this process, uh, so this is just to illustrate um, some of those changes that have happened and, and how different the landscape, even the, what we consider to be the quite natural bits of the landscape, look now compared to how they looked historically. So we've seen these massive declines in grazing pressure, especially on the, the dunes and um, salt marsh, huge declines in rabbit populations. And we've also seen um, this massive enrichment of nutrients in the soil and in the water that Rob mentioned that, that leads to this really green rich habitat that's full of trees and that has a lot more potentially a lot more um, uh, uh, tree growth and tree cover than there would have been historically and that loss of connectivity between habitats like dunes and heaths that were once adjacent that are now quite quite fragmented and separated. The other key part of this is to think about what the future holds, and I've talked a bit about risks. An obviously critical one when we're thinking about the, the Norfolk coast is the risks posed by sea level rise and the change in sea levels. And we know that this is something that's likely to happen, not just the, sea, the, the rise in average sea levels, but the increasing frequency of flooding events. The likelihood is that we'll see more and more extreme storm surges, tidal surges and flooding events that are going to be uh, having a massive impact on um, the habitats. And if we look at the projections based on uh, the, the best guess scenarios at the moment, even by, by 2050, so quite close uh, um, time horizon, we're likely to see a massive increase in the amount of the landscape that could be below the high water mark. This is without further efforts by humans to try and engineer the landscape to, to try and reduce that impact. Um, but dealing with this change in, in the sea level is going to be really important. And whatever we do for conservation, we've got to be able to, to make it resilient to these changes. And if we look a bit further down the line with a one metre sea level rise, which is thought to be a likely scenario by 2100, you can see that the majority of this landscape we're talking about is forecast to end up being below the high water mark. Um, without uh, significant changes to um, uh, the way that we manage the, the environment to try and reduce that impact. So we've got to think about the, the prospect of this changing um, sea level. And there's another big change that's really um, important to bear in mind and that we're focusing on in this, which is the change in policy, which is very uh, um, timely right now with the environment bill that the government has, has introduced and the, the, the shift from our traditional agri-environment funding mechanisms, the countryside stewardship, towards the new scheme, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, ELMS, which will be replacing the way we pay farmers and land management managers for conservation in 2024. And this could be quite a, a big change, that the way it's being talked about and planned at the moment is 
uh, putting much more focus on landscape scale connected action and doing things in the right places in the landscape and doing big projects uh, for, for land use change, for wetland restoration that involve lots of land managers working together. And this is quite an exciting prospect. And this is one of the things that Rob's mentioned with the big network of farmers in the Brex and the network of farmers who are funding this audit project um, in, in the Norfolk coast. And in fact, we're aware of um, seven different big clusters of farmers in Norfolk who've already all come together and are trying to coordinate their conservation management plans to come up with these big, large scale, coordinated, connected ways of enhancing uh, the landscape for biodiversity because they know that that's the direction the policy is going so they know that agri-environment funding is going to increasingly target these kind of big coordinated actions so there's this huge eagerness amongst farmers and land managers to do big to think big in conservation to do make big changes and so providing this information that the audit can provide for what they can actually do and target with these big initiatives is, I think it's really timely and it's one of the things that we really want to, to try and deliver. And it's also really exciting for us because there really is an opportunity here to, to make some quite big and potentially highly beneficial changes to, to, to the landscapes. So what we're aiming to do, we're quantifying the full suite of biodiversity, we're quantifying the importance of the landscape. So once we've got all of that information, we can look at uh, look at the, this landscape in a national context and really identify which elements of it are most uh, valuable, work out what the different species groups need, and also look at these scenarios and try and come up with plans that, that are resilient to, to things like climate change and sea level rise. So that's our sort of aim. What we're now um, going to briefly talk you through is where we're at with this process, what we're actually doing, because uh, this is very much an active project. We're in, we're right in, in the in the middle of it now, um, and what I'm going to do now is hand over to Dan Salis, who's going to speak uh, for a little bit, because Dan's the the research associate at UEA, who's really driving the process. He's doing most of the the heavy lifting and hard work at the moment, working with all the data. So he's going to talk through a little bit what this process is entailing and, and where it's going. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Dan now. Um, I can't hear you. Dan, I think you're on mute. There we go. There we go. Uh, yes, thanks, James. So I'm just going to um, just go through what I've been up to in the last couple of months and um, what I'm going to be going through uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so over the last few months, I've been working um, mainly on the data collation, the data gathering, which has evolved, um, contacting loads of people via, um, via email. So I've been living in my email for the past couple of months. Um, and some of you may have heard of me. Um, and if you corresponded with me and provided data or confirmed where your data is, uh, thank you very much. And you know, your help is so invaluable to this project. Uh, so this is the, the study area that we're looking at to gather data from or that we've that we've been gathering data from. Um, and as you may notice, it extends quite far inland. And this is really important for um, for mitigation. And, you know, as James was showing you there with you know, potential sea level rises, we're, we're looking to see where um, similar habitats that we find on the coast, where they, they can be found inland, especially um, sort of freshwater based habitats. Um, so this is a, a flyer that I've been sending out um, while contacting sort of naturalists and experts, um, uh, national schemes, landowners, just giving a, an overview of our project and a, an overview of our, our data request. Uh, so I've approached over 160 data providers, um, mainly recorders and naturalists and um, sort of organisations uh, and national schemes and uh, with a few landowners in there as well. Um, so yeah, over 160 data providers. So uh, yeah, a lot of emails that I've been sending out, but it's um, it's been brilliant that we've had been able to get into contact with so many people. 
Uh, and thanks again, again, if you've um, corresponded with me. Uh, so this is a subset of some of the data. Um, it's a heat map showing you where the majority of the um, of the records lie. And this is uh, from MBIS with a few MVN records in there as well. Uh, and the darker, the darker areas show uh, the larger amount of records. Um, and this is non-vertebrate records only, but a um, yeah a massive amount of records and you know almost nine thousand species in there. And part of this process will be identifying where the gaps in the landscape of where those records, not only where those records are, but where 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 are the under-recorded areas of uh, the North Norfolk coast. So what I'm now working on is the data cleaning. And here's a nice picture of me data cleaning from home. Uh, and so what this uh, data cleaning process involves is going through all the different um, data sets that we've gathered from people, um, sort of getting into a format that's uh, standardized, sorting out any obvious errors or um, format issues, um, and taking out some sort of records that we won't be using, including um, things like genus and higher up, um, taxonomic um, categories uh, and also as well as records that aren't in our study area um, and then eventually after a lot of work bringing it into one big data set. So I'm just going to hand back to uh, to Rob now. Brilliant thank you Dan for that and um, yeah that that brings us neatly on to the next stage of the uh, project that would be a uh, effectively happening after or as Dan starts cleaning and bringing the data sets together and that's a really important stage it's the data validation so obviously all these data sets that Dan has uh, pulled together thanks to the enormous help we've had from recorders organizations societies that cleaning exercise and that data gathering exercise creates a vast number of records as you saw from the Brex audit there was nearly a million records um, all in and for the Brawls audit it, it was approaching it exceeded one and a half million so a vast number of records but the issue is is the accuracy um, so obviously for a lot of societies and groups that record goes through a pre-filtering process so a lot of the data is already in a good way by the time we get it but there's still oddities in there that need resolving and the reason this is so important is if we essentially have the wrong species or a few inaccuracies, the list we generate, the list of the conservation priorities starts to essentially errors start creeping in. And that becomes more of a problem still when that's extrapolated out to the kind of conservation measures and approaches that we're advocating on the back of this audit. Again, and uh, errors in this type of exercise are inevitable, but the, the, the process, the, the whole idea of the validation stage is to capture and resolve as many of those as possible before this filters into recommendations. So in terms of what this process will involve and the reason for it, the why do we validate, as I mentioned, it, a lot of it's to do with misidentification errors, um, misspecies, so there, there, there could be one or two important areas or a species that hasn't been captured through the data sets we've got already which um, which could be important new taxonomic splits so this is a particular headache for um, some groups are renowned for it um, I know I've certainly when going through some of the coleoptera groups before been tearing my hair out at uh, recent changes of, of names but these are really important they're particularly important where a data set is slightly older and new splits have happened since and the these kinds of splits aren't always picked up during the cleaning stage we try and find as many as possible but this is why we need validation current status so whether a species is extinct and it's uh, still present in the area and also to identify regional specialists so obviously it's quite easy to identify whether something's nationally scarce rare a data book but through validation we're hoping to uncover what, essentially what's normal for norfolk but scarce elsewhere in the country and how does this all work so what we will be doing shortly is contacting the county recorders 
and asking whether they'd be happy to um, essentially look through a long list of species. So not, not all the records, it would be yeah, a nightmare of a task to go through that, but essentially a list of the species names for the relevant taxonomic group that they focus on, along with a year of when that record was last recorded to, uh, yeah, to ask whether they can hopefully help us uh, check whether everything's okay and uh, help us with the validation. And again, this just epitomizes the uh, the point we've been making throughout that, uh, that the help of the wider recorder community and the naturalist community is so pivotal to what we're doing for an audit. And yeah, the same is true with the previous audits and it's exactly the same with this one as well. So, Whilst that's happening, and uh, probably slightly after, um, probably Dan again actually, um, will be spending a lot of time just trying to gather basic bits of ecological information for those species that we found through the data cleaning exercise and, and essentially what's also been resolved through the validation. And the idea is by using data such, uh, such as Pantheon, which is a, a resource provided and hosted by Natural England, where you can plug in a list of invertebrates. It's a brilliant console, it's free to use. And um, that console effectively, once you put your list of species in, it will give you a series of attributes of habitat dietary associations. And by building this information together, along with uh, probably some literature searches as well and other sources to gather this information, we can start to build a picture of what each species is associated with. And that knowledge allows us to in turn group species into these management guilds that we've talked before. In terms of what we think is likely to be important aspects of these guilds for North Norfolk, for the North Norfolk coast, sorry, is um, the, the types of gradients such as, for example, freshwater to saline habitat. So how tolerant a species is or what its requirement is for freshwater or salinity. Um, another important guild is, is likely to be grazing intensity. And as James mentioned with his previous slides, you can see there's been a, a real dynamic change in how the landscape has, has shifted and, and not moved, but how, how it's changed the management pressures imposed by grazing. So there'll be species in there that are associated with more lightly grazed or ungrazed conditions, and there'll be those that require more intensive conditions caused by grazing. And another crucial one we suspect will be uh, vegetation density. So a good example of this is likely to be dune systems. Again, those species that are associated with more, I guess, stable areas and those species that require those bare, open, warm habitats. And that's not just true for dunes as well. That'd be true for, again, other other systems throughout the, uh, throughout the habitats you get in the North Norfolk coast. So these are some of the gills that we envisage will be important for it. And once we've done that, so once we've gathered this basic information, the key bit is to link that to actual management practice. So the whole idea with these guilds, instead of sort of having these rather conceptual ideas of what these groups are, is to have them directly link, link to the management processes. So James has already talked about a recipe of management solutions for the area, and this is exactly what it does. But if you have a series of conditions that are being flagged up as particularly important for large numbers of species. It's important that we think what is that, that we what we it's important that we think how this is realistically achieved through the management that's available within the system. So, for example, how grazing can be tweaked, how management and machinery can be used to create these conditions. So, part of the audit process, as well as doing the ecological building side, is speaking to the the land managers involved as well to find out different ranges of current management or what management could be possible to promote the conditions that the biodiversity needs. And then the final step is a final stage of validation. And at this point, we, we would have built up provisional guilds along with the information um, that underpinned these guilds for each species. So, um, so for every priority species that our, our data collection and validation has thrown up, We'll have provisional guild assignments and the idea is to run virtual workshops where we bring together people who are interested in this who've got a obviously a natural history knowledge and can essentially help us refine the guild so what pantheon assigns and what we initially assign based on bits of information are likely to move about and there'll be species that may subtly subtly move move across different guilds there could be species that quite dramatically move again it's it's all about refining um this list the the, the species groups with expert knowledge and then after that, a final list will be produced with the guild associations for a final check over from the people who are keen to do that. And that will provide the product 
and that product is essentially going to be a, a, an audit report highlighting essentially the species we found, their distribution, what's important, and the management that could be implemented to um, bring about these species, as well, well, to cater for these species, as well as some of the concepts that James is going to talk about in a second. But as well as these reports, the other important aspect of the output stage is the feedback. And it's the feedback to the landowner group who, who will ultimately be implementing these, these types of practices and processes to cater for the biological resource that the audit highlights as important. So just to finish up this talk, I'm going to pass you to James one more time to uh, yeah, just talk about some of the future challenges of all of this and its implement implementations there. Thanks, Rob. So yeah, just to, to to sum up again, you know, we've we've talked a lot about the process and what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve with this project, um, and really it is all about uh, trying to prepare. Um, readiness by, by pulling together the information that we can and making it available to as many people as possible who are who are doing management who are making decisions to try and make sure that um, the, the coastal habitats continue to be as as incredibly biodiverse and, and full of wildlife as they are now and even even more so and we mentioned some of these challenges looking forward and and some of them are in, in some ways quite sort of terrifying and we looked at the you know those maps of the um the sea level rise scenarios and the prospect for uh more and more of this kind of um damage uh happening along the coastline and it is quite worrying but at the same time i you know it, there are there are opportunities we, that are coming with these changes especially for for uh, the biodiversity and for the conservation of natural environments. So the sea level rise issue in particular, you know, it's really important to recognize that um, the solution to this issue is there in the natural habitats, the natural environment, salt marsh habitats and dune habitats, they, they are adapted to this kind of change and to this kind of uh, event. And it's those natural parts of the coastline when there are storm surges and when there are big flooding events, those those parts that are more natural that have the full uh, dune systems and salt marsh systems, they tend to absorb that very, very easily. It's the bits that we've engineered uh, where the natural part of the landscape has gone that get hit badly. Nature's infrastructure is far better at handling these changes than, than human infrastructure. And recognizing that, there's an opportunity for, uh, for us as, as uh, conservationists to make the case that we should be restoring and enhancing those natural environments because they can help protect what's in land from the, these changes in sea levels that are to come. Another big change, of course, is, is climate change itself and the rising temperatures. And that's a whole other set of, of uncertainties. Um, how will our biodiversity cope with, with a hotter environment? Um, at the same time, that itself brings its own opportunities. And of course, we know that the biodiversity is changing and we're getting new species colonizing. Um, so we're welcoming new additions to, to the biodiversity. In some cases, they may be species that, that, that we know occurred here long ago and were lost and they're now coming back. Um, but there are opportunities in even changes like climate change for, a, for potentially a, um, a richer and more biodiverse environment. The thing that's perhaps most exciting um, for me is off the back of this audit process, especially, you know, I talked about those farmer networks, these big groups of farmers and land managers and conservation organizations who are all coming together at the moment and thinking about how to join up and do landscape scale conservation. There's a lot of talk about rewilding. There's a lot of talk about doing big things to benefit nature. There's a tremendous opportunity, I think, in the next few years to really make some big changes uh, in Norfolk to, um, to enhance and improve the, uh, the wildlife um, that, that, we, uh, that we support in our landscape. And part of that, you know, we think about the, um, the new species that are coming with, with climate change. I'm really excited at the prospect of also these, these big joined up landscape scale initiatives allowing potentially for us to recover some things that we've lost um, over that those those decades of changes with with agricultural intensification it's quite possible that many of these species could recolonize naturally if we can provide these big contiguous areas of more joined up uh, and well-managed 
wildlife habitats. So I think there's a lot of cause for optimism. And we really hope that the audit will help and going through these audits will help make sure that managers can deliver the, the, the best possible kinds of management uh, to, to benefit that biodiversity. So it's all about harnessing this data and knowledge that already exists, that's been generated by, uh, by these armies of, of people like yourselves who go out and record biodiversity and uh, record nature, harnessing all of that and making it available to land managers uh, and hopefully using that to, to seize some of these new opportunities to, to better protect biodiversity. So that's it. The, the final thing is just to say thanks. And there are, there's a vast number of people to thank in this, this project. But, uh, you know, the, the, the partners, uh, there's an awful lot of organizations who are partnering up, who are helping with the funding uh, together with that North Norfolk Coastal Group. But especially is to say thank you to, the, to, to all of the people who provide data on biodiversity. So we've named a few there, but also anyone who provides data to uh, to county recorders and to NBIS. It's really you who make, who provides that information that we can then use to, uh, to try and make these positive changes. So thank you to all of you, especially for that. Um, I hope it's been interesting. And yeah, we, uh, we've got some time for questions, so do fire away. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Fantastic, thank you all. Um, I think that was incredibly interesting. I wonder if um, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, Rob, and we can all turn our cameras on and, and yep. start the conversation. Now. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. So I think we've got um, Carl Brooker has a question there. I wonder if you want to read it out, Carl, or if you want us to read it for you. No, I'm happy to answer that. Um, yeah, I just wondered, being as um, I'm the ranger responsible for a large section of that ghost, uh, that you'd actually spoke to the National Trust and obviously said in the in the final words there that you are. Um, but <laughs> so I was just a bit surprised to find out we've been talking to you and, and I'm the guy on the ground, that's all. Yeah, sorry if it's if that's not filtered down as far as you. Um, but yeah, the, the National Trust are on board and um, yeah, they've they're one of our, our partners. And I know they've um, they have been providing data. Maybe Dan or Rob, do you know the the exact um, status of national um, trusting? Yeah, so we have been in contact with them for data. Um, the last contact we had from them, they were saying they were sort of sorting through what they've already provided to uh, the MBN and MBIS, okay. um, and they were going to send us the rest. So we're just sort of waiting to hear back from them. Okay. But we will absolutely be in touch with you, in, especially in due course when it comes to that, the, the, the workshop stages uh, where we, we're going to start opening the conversation to, especially to, to managers. Um, uh, so, yeah, <laughs> watch this space. But, yeah, we're... Uh, yeah. Um, the, the wheels of the National Trust turn very slowly. <laughs> yeah, and almost as slow as they do in acad academia where yeah. we live. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, but thanks. We also have a thank you from Mike um, for such an informative and illuminating talk. Just wanted to feed that back. I will send you a copy of the comments as well um, so that you can read, read any feedback. Um, I'll jump in with a question if that's okay. Um, so you obviously mentioned a lot that, you know, we could have emerging species or returning species that come back due to climate change um, and, and differences. But I wonder, is, is there kind of, have you got a sort of a guild um, that would benefit specifically from climate change? Will that will that be put into kind of future mapping of, of what the potentials could be for, for the North Norfolk coast? We're, um, we're still sort of deliberating how best to, to work out um, at the sort of species level, the potential impacts of climate change. And of course, it's extremely difficult to forecast. So uh, some of my work, um, uh, related to this, I do a lot of modelling of trying to understand how species distributions might change in response to climate. Uh, and we're quite good at making models to predict what will happen. When you then compare those models to what does happen, you find that actually your models are very often not very good and species don't do what, what you think they're going to do. Um, so our ability to really forecast how things will respond to climate change and which species are likely to colonise we, we do our best with that, but it's actually very hard. 
Um, so it will be part of the process, but it, it's not possible to to reliably come up with guilds of species that are that are um, are going to benefit from climate change. We can make predictions, but it's amazing how often our predictions turn out to be not um, not quite right. <laughs> But no, yeah, absolutely. it's <laughs> that's the problem with models, isn't it? And in any case, um, but no, that makes complete sense. I do have more, but I just um, I didn't want to butt in too much. I can see we've got another question here from Elizabeth. I wondered if you wanted to ask it. Hello, thank you for an absolutely brilliant talk. That was so informative. Um, I was just wondering if microorganisms were included in the audit. No, I should probably have said um, we, we're not including microorganisms. Um, it's, they've not been audit included previously. And primarily that's just because um, The, there's a very different, uh, they, they, they form a very different world ecologically and um, very different sets of biologists look at them and they work, they operate on things at different scales. Um, so yeah, we, we're not including microorganisms primarily because we have no expertise in that we could use to really, to put them into this framework. Uh, it would be a fascinating thing to audit um, and yeah, it would be really good to to um, to do a, an audit of microorganism diversity. Um, but because it's such a different world, and, and indeed, you know, the, the the knowledge of the spatial distribution of microorganisms, I know, is is extremely um, thin. So uh, it would be a fascinating thing to do, but it's it's beyond our reach, uh, unfortunately. Thanks, James. Got a question here from Mark Collins. Mark, would you like to take it away? Thanks very much. Um, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, Broadland District Council is about to launch the new country park northwest of Norwich, and um, uh, NNNS is developing a project to monitor and uh, the impact of changing habitat management, which is likely to be quite rapid, and, and indeed climate change on, the, uh, on a longer time scale on this site as it develops. Could this approach that you've described of large scale audits also be applied on this rather smaller scale? It's a good question. Um, so it's The, what the, the audit works best um, by being able to sort of bring together um, these vast amounts of data collected primarily by, um, by, by wildlife enthusiasts, people who go out and record things. Um, the data do tend to be quite patchy in space. Um, if you looked at a single site and tried to do an audit of, based on the data that, that's gathered at that site, it depends really on, on what historical recording has been done and how complete that would be. The way this would work best really, and this is something that we've been, uh, we have been um, talking about and thinking about, is trying to expand this approach. And so far we've done audits for, for the Brecklands, we've done audits for the, uh, well, the Paul Dolman and his team have audited the Brecklands, Broads, the Fens, we're now doing the, the, the Norfolk coast to extend it to as many habitats as possible to the point where we'd be able to take uh, the information on the species guilds and then apply it to any small scale site. Maybe we, maybe the, the data from that site itself isn't rich enough to say very much, but we can look at the, the habitat features of the site and compare it to similar sites elsewhere and then provide that kind of guidance. So, uh, I think it would be hard to, to do this process at a very small scale and capture everything that might be there just because the data available at that small scale probably wouldn't be um, enough to really g give you a comprehensive picture. But if that, if that small site fell within a sort of wider uh, group of environments that we could do a full audit of, then that could be informative, if you see what I mean. But in, in simple terms, um, 
the the process of of trying to gather all the information there is on which invertebrates and plants and species that there, there are or might be at that site and then going through and working out their needs it could it could in principle be done for a for a small scale site as well um it's just i'd be it's just a question of whether you would capture everything at that kind of scale if you see what i mean i don't know if uh, rob or dan you may have a better answer than me. <laughs> I, don't know, I i i think i think that cap captures the main bits and i mean the, the the one i guess the one other extension that we're looking at with audits is this um i mean i i love this idea that you you've you've got different you've got different biogeographical regions across the country and wouldn't it be wonderful if you had something like this in in other area that really shines out what the priorities are and what their needs are but there are again where you've got issues where a site has perhaps been under recorded again it feeds into this idea what james mentioned that if you if you've looked at the region as a whole you you get that information but one of the things we're trying to develop this is probably more relevant to farmed habitats is this idea of an area has been poorly recorded but you know what the important guilds are from the surrounding landscape you can use the existing records to develop models to predict what could occur in that other site um, if recording effort had been equivalent or or something akin to what it is in the surrounding landscape so we're trying to think about how audits can be used to inform targeting of particular guilds but again this um to do all of that it's, it's having if, if, if you have it underpinned by a larger area you can you can then start to unpicking what can be done on an individual site and perhaps even predicting what species are most likely to be on that site and what guilds um, those species would be lovely thank you mark did that answer your your question or do you have any further follow-ups well uh, thank you Danielle if, if you want to give me an opportunity yeah I, I appreciate what you're saying that um, at a small relatively small site like this new country park um, there wouldn't be enough data to do the analysis I think what, what I would be more getting at and maybe this is a, an additional question is let's put it another way we've got a, a new site we'd like to do an audit in 20 years what do we do now to make it sure that you can do that effectively for this site so we've got all the naturalists there are all the recorders in nns we're about to launch information to them to say look uh, you can come here we've got letters of authority we've got an agreement with the district council but um, what we're lacking at the moment, possibly, is a framework uh, within which all these recorders can work. Now, you, you're coming in sort of post hoc. Uh, all the recorders have done this recording over a long period of time. You're dealing with information, you're validating it, your data cleaning and all this. Now, if we could establish this uh, process from the beginning, all that data cleaning and validating could be reduced significantly and you could be getting a much more targeted project to identify the information you want is it, it that's more perhaps where i'm coming from i don't know if that's clear yeah so the i mean i've i've, I've got almost a short term idea and a longer term one the, the first thing i would encourage to do is if you've got that vast amount of biological recording happening that's that's the most important bit it underpins everything and what i would encourage with that is is get is making sure that data goes back to embers and uh, so when we do an audit our uh, one of the main data sets that we rely upon is is embers i um, in the case of obviously our county and that that service that embers provides through county recorders makes sure it essentially ensures that the records entered in a standardized way and it's validated so that creates this ongoing repository that then builds and builds and builds and that's a point when you 
want to do an audit for your area or the, or the surrounding landscape as well that information will be there so that's that that's key and that builds up to, to it gives more information for when you do an audit and if you're covering vast taxonomic groups you've 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 done the tricky part already the other thing I guess I would I'd probably mention just as an interesting tool it's, it's it's obviously not the same as doing an audit but it's part of what we do with an audit anyway is um if you're if you're just interested to see what's what's on the site and what the associations are of the species you're starting to generate is is using Pantheon and as you start to develop these species list from the recorders coming in and you send it to MBIS you can extract your own species list from from obviously the data that you provided to MBIS and put it into Pantheon and it will give you pie charts automatically by literally copying an excel spreadsheet of uh, what species are in there what groups they are it will return site quality index scores but but crucially it will come out with some of the information of what the species are associated with and it, it's that type of information albeit on a smaller scale that's then repeated for when we do audits for for regions so just two ideas but the yeah, the key one i would say is, is making sure the the records go to the county uh and the county recorders Does, did, did that did that cover? Uh, thanks very much. I don't want to take up too much of everybody's valuable time. Yeah, we are, of course are. Um, we've got a working group. Enbis is part of that. Uh, we are planning. Everything will go into Enbis, of course. It's really more. Um, I'm wondering about the the way, the way it is. All the recorders come in, sort of do their own thing. Is that I'm I'm wondering if there's a more a more structured um, sampling approach that that has been tried um, or that should be tried in order to make this more effective. But I, I really don't want to take up other people's valuable question time. It's been very useful. Yeah, it, but it, yeah, it sounds like you you have an opportunity to do something more more like a structured monitoring protocol. Uh, and the audit is really about making the, the best use of unstructured data. But if you've got the opportunity to do something structured, then brilliant. And I'll be, you know, um, we, we can share uh, contact details. I'd be happy to, if, you, if, if you'd like any guidance from myself or Paul or an academic, then we'd be happy to provide on how that might look. Excellent. Did anyone have any questions that they'd like to shout out for Rob, James and Dan? Okie dokie. I'll, um, we've got one here from Emma. Would you like to, to voice your question, Emma? Yeah, hi. Um, sorry. Yeah, I just had a question. So I know you've been working with the Breck farmers and I'm aware that um, one of the estates there is planning on doing a lot of tree planting. And I just wondered how that sort of impacts on the work that you've been doing and what your thoughts are on that. It's really interesting, interesting you should mention this, Emma. This is, this is something where you, you may have remembered one of the slides, you saw this heat map of an estate yeah. and where the margins are and that's that's calibrated using these these models that i was touching upon a minute ago of, of a guild of disturbance associated species and where it's best to place your margins and what what we're thinking about now is how this analytical tool can be expanded to consider other ecosystem services such as this um, obviously tree plantings one other one is establishment i guess of more fixed permanent features or even other agri-environment options that are doing different things so we we've created this tool and we've created something quite refined for this particularly important guild albeit but what we're what we're expanding the thinking to now is essentially how do you reconcile that with these other priorities could you potentially have almost sort of a different sequence of heat maps and then use some kind of spatial prioritization tool to almost allocate that these are the best areas to do this and these are the best areas to do that so the key thing certainly for disturbance open habitat species is to prioritize those areas that we suspect are going to be best for these and the best areas to do linkages the best areas to do more of this habitat to make sure they're actually set aside for doing that whereas yeah these other priorities are delivered in other bits of the landscape and we we may find out that there's almost this 
perfect separation between what you want to do and what and what the other one is but there's inevitably probably going to be some overlap but we're that's what we're extending the tool over hopefully the next few months to to look at um hopefully yeah. with relevance to obviously other other systems because this isn't obviously a, pr a problem that's just unique to the brex it's um it's a uh, not a problem but it's a consideration that's relevant to other areas as well is that um if i could just ask another question so is that something that's discussed within the farmers groups in terms of um because i know with regards to the far the, the estate i'm thinking of um it's very much being pushed towards carbon capture as to why they're planting these trees um but i do know i just wondered if it's things like the biodiversity audit and the work that's being done there and management outputs that you've, you've recommended for things is that considered as well or has that so traditionally the so when, when the breckland audit was done it was it was very focused on on guilds based on um conservation biological conservation delivery what we're, what we're expanding towards now particularly with the north norfolk coast because obviously there's this this such a pressing case study and important change with sea level rise and other things is how is almost doing an audit based on the biological records, but having a consideration of how these other ecosystem service, other important national and local priorities can be reconciled as part of the process. So, um, so certainly now in terms of how we're thinking in areas like the Brex where the audit has already happened, it's, it's almost retrospectively, we're looking at how this can be, these different priorities can be reconciled. In the case of the North Norfolk Coast audit, um, I think James will agree with this as well, is the, these, ecosystem services these changes are being sort of almost considered from um i guess an earlier stage at the onset but you you it's a really good you know there is absolutely a potential tension there between uh, managing for biodiversity and managing for carbon capture and the the rush to, to plant trees especially for climate mitigation um if it isn't uh done um, wisely, it does have the potential to have uh, negative impacts on on biodiversity, amongst other things. You know, and there are, there are big concerns, not just about biodiversity, but also about water and the amount of water that that can uh, uh, water resource that could potentially be um, compromised by an awful lot of tree planting in places where there isn't a huge amount of thought going into it. So there's a there is a there's a danger there certainly, and it's really important to to make sure that the land managers as much as possible are uh, using tools and information to try and plan where are the right places for carbon capture, tree planting, where are the right places for, for other things, for biodiversity and, uh, and other stuff. Yeah, but a really good question. Thank you. Sorry, I don't want to butt in, Emma, if you have a further question. <laughs> Perfect. Did anyone else have any any questions they'd like to ask? I'll ask one more because I've put in quite a few and I'm aware that it's getting quite late in your evening. Um, this is mainly for myself mourning the loss of the bug sorting workshop weekends. Um, but once once you've identified the gaps, um, the gaps of records for certain sites is there going to be an opportunity for kind of bio blitzes or, or further terrace hit bug sorting workshops to kind of try and bridge that gap we we really would like this to be a, an ongoing process um and how, you know a, a big part of it and we're just you know really this is driven by um the consortium of land managers who've come together saying we want this audit done, who are going to be hopefully providing the continuity in that that part of part of the world. Um, but yeah, really, the, the hope is that it, it's the beginning of a process and we produce the first document and it will highlight gaps and then that can lead to absolutely to further workshops. Uh, um, and and highlight areas where more works needed. So yeah, that's that's absolutely a hope. Um, if, if, if it can lead to things like that, it'll be brilliant. Um, fingers crossed. 
guess particularly where there's some, I guess, more experimental management ideas that the audit throws out that could be maybe quite wacky to begin with. And we, we do want to establish how they're working. But those, yeah, those volunteer sorting marathons were, um, were brilliant. <laughs> I love doing them. They were, um, they, and, and solved a huge problem of just, you have this huge amount of material when you do any type of invertebrate collection and um, just bring in 20, 30 people together. It sounds so weird now, a year into COVID, but um, when uh, when this was obviously having this when we did the PhD was a yeah it was a brilliant brilliant solution and um, I've, I've, yeah it seemed that quite a few people enjoyed the process as well of of coming along it was quite, yeah quite therapeutic to spend a day putting ground beetles rove beetles and and all other types of creatures into bots. Thank you. I'll give people an opportunity to ask a final question and then. Um, and then I think we'll, we'll release you for the evening uh, and be very grateful to you for spending your time giving us a talk. So did anyone have any further questions they'd like to ask? Okay, um, I just wanted to, again, thank you guys so much. It was a really interesting talk. Um, as I said to Rob earlier, we'd be so happy to hear about any further updates, progress, um, and, and you know what, what recommendations you do make for the North Norfolk coast. Um, if there are any gaps as well, I'm sure just pop us, a, pop us an email and we can see, we can see what we can do. Um, but yes, thank you ever so much. And I hope you have a fantastic evening. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah, it was, yeah thanks everyone. Thank you, Daniel.